everyone. Welcome to the Newburyport Literary Festival. You may have been to some events already today, but if not, we're so glad you're here. My name is Leslie Hendrickson. I'm on the steering committee of the festival, and we're so excited about the festival this year. This is our second year online and our 16th edition. Of course, we hope to be back in person next year, but this format has allowed us to bring a lot of new and different authors to the festival. And in fact, it's our biggest year with more than 100 participants. Just a couple things before we get started. We're using the webinar format. You might know this already, but you'll hear and see the panelists. You won't be able to see yourself. If you have comments, please use the chat box at the bottom of the Zoom screen. Feel free to let everyone know where you're from, if you're new to the festival, or if you're an old friend. There will be time for questions at the end of the presentation. Please use the Q&A tab instead of the chat tab to put your questions. Um, that way the presenters can see them and keep them more organized. As you may know, today is Independent Bookstore Day and we want to support our independent bookstore partners. Links to our bookstore partners, the Bookshop of Beverly Farms and Jabberwocky here in Newburyport are in the chat or they will be when I put them there. And they have books from all of our authors. We encourage you to support them or your local independent bookshop. I'm gonna give short introductions to our speakers today, but you can find more information about them at our website. Um, and I will also link that to in the, to the chat. So for starters, Peter Goralnik has been called a national resource for his work that argues passionately and persuasively for the vitality of this country's intertwined black and white musical traditions. He's written about Elvis, Sam Cooke, and Sam Phillips, among others, and his latest book is called Looking to Get Lost. Mark Feeney is a Pulitzer Prize winning arts writer at the Boston Globe. He is the author of Nixon at the Movies, a book about belief, and is currently working on a book about the 1970s. He's a lecturer in American Studies at Brandeis and has also taught at Princeton, Yale, Brown, and Boston College. And with that, I'm gonna hand it over to you, Mark. Thank you both for being here. Thank you, Leslie. So I wanna begin with a bit of heresy. Uh, I bet most of the people who are here and they're right to be here because who would pass up a chance to hear Peter Goralnik talk uh, are here because of these magnificent, very well-known biographies of Elvis, Sam Cooke and Sam Phillips. But which, which each individually and all together have made a true contribution to America. And everything Leslie said in that brief introduction is absolutely right. However, here's where the heresy comes in. I think it's books like Looking to Get Lost and your first two collections, uh, Feel Like Going Home and Lost Highway with their short profiles of lesser known figures that have offered, continue to offer an even richer contribution to our deepening appreciation of American culture. So here's my question. Don't worry, uh, listeners, or watchers, I will not go on like this uh, in, for the rest of the time. What took so long? The lot of these have been around for a long time. Why, why, why didn't we get looking to get lost earlier? Well, I, um, you know, I can't tell you how upset Sam Phillips would be. <laughs> you say that you know it's I'm I'm not denying it, but I just I'm just you know I'm mindful of his feelings, but I, I don't know I I had in my I've had in mind to do an anthology of some kind. Originally, I thought of it as as a series of blues portraits, people like Big Joe Williams, for instance, people I hadn't written about before. But what took so long is that basically I spent the last it's 25 years before this working on the three biographies, and. Um, that sort of took me out of things. I was in the middle of a novel when I started on the Elvis. I've gone back to it inter intermittently, but I've never finished it. But after I, after I finished the Sam Phillips, I, among other things, one of the things that I wanted to write, and this may be heretical too, because this is outside of the short profiles, I really wanted a home for the Dick Curlis profile, which I had been meaning to write for 20 years. And I never had the, an appropriate home for it. And I always conceived of it as kind of a nonfiction novella. So, and also I, I just, more and more, I began to see a theme that could link 
the stories that I'd written in the past and the stories I was writing now. And it was this ongoing pursuit. It was kind of like Richard Holmes's footsteps. It's, it's mm -hmm. the, the pursuit of something the indefinable and that you'll never fully achieve. But, but it, it amounted to, uh, the reason I called it adventures uh, in, um, you know, in music and writing. And my daughter Nina said, you can't call it adventures, you know, it should be profiles. But the thing was that it was, you know, what I came to realize it was, it was that it was my adventures, not to put the emphasis on that, but it was my adventures as well as the adventures of the people I was writing about. So I began to see this. And the other thing, and I have to really give credit where credit is due, sitting in this very room where you and I have sat, uh, Mark, um, uh, Michael Peach came out to see me about five years ago. Uh, and Michael Peach, your, your Michael, editor. My editor, my editor since 1992 at Little Brown and, and my very good friend. And he was determined, he, he thought this idea of an anthology was terrific. I broached it to him, but I said, I, I can't do it. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. And he came out here and he took, you know, uh, a car out from the airport and we sat here and had coffee and talked or tea maybe. And uh, I was certain I wasn't going to do the book and he really spoke for about three minutes and I said, okay, I'll do it. So that's, that's how, what a hard sell it was for him. But I, no, it's what I wanted to do it. And, and to me, it was, it's really fun to go from one thing to another. And, and I mean, I've been writing short stories all this time and my heart is, is in everything that, I, everything that I write. I'm not claiming the achievement, but I am claiming the ardent pursuit. Yeah. Well, you, you really, I mean, at the heart of all of your writing, I think, is enthusiasm. Uh, you, you know, you can, I mean, criticism is a funny word. We, we think of it as negative. Well, don't criticize me. But criticism, in another sense, is a little bit understanding. And you are helping us understand all of these artists in, in so many different forms. That's part of what's so great about the book. We've got writers, we've got country music, we've got rock, we've got blues. It's, this is an odd question to ask, but how important is passion for you as a writer? I mean, I have a hard time thinking of you going through the motions. No, I, I, I can't. I mean, I, I go back over and over again to the old song, which Sister Rosetta Tharp sang and many others, 99 and a half won't do. Mm -hmm. And it absolutely won't. And passion is everything. And passion is everything, no matter what you do, as far as I'm concerned. But as, you know, as far as I'm concerned, every, every book I've written, every piece I've written is a product of my own enthusiasm for the subject. And uh, I, I couldn't write about somebody of whom I disapproved. Now, what right do I have to disapprove of anybody? If I got deep enough into it, maybe I wouldn't. But but the point mm -hmm. is, I'm drawn to people that I that I admire, and passion is what drives it. But the other thing that drives it is a responsibility to the subject, and that and to the reader. And the, that responsibility requires a degree of uh, analytic application that makes you try to figure out what really happened. Now, again, I'm not claiming the achievement. Everything is effort, everything is aspiration. But, but truly, I just feel like you look at it and you look at it and you look at it and you're drawn to it from passion and you try to write with passion and ultimately the tone I want to achieve is a lyrical tone really. Yeah. But, but nonetheless, what is it that really happened? What does this mean? You know, Don't fall back on easy assumptions. Don't go in with any uh, you know, preconceived ideas and throw out all your preconceived ideas as much as that's possible. If I'm writing about music, listen to the music. If I'm writing about the English novelist, Henry Green, I went back and reread uh, virtually all of the books that I uh, spoke about in this, in this uh, portrait of him. The very first time I conducted anything resembling an, a, uh, an interview and I was um, 19, I guess at the time and just scared to death. But, but I went back and I looked at them and I want always to look and listen with, with a fresh eye and a fresh ear. And so the, it's that combination of things. If you, know, if you don't try to consider the reality, if you don't, don't try to summon up the reality, which maybe is just how the weather was, but I mean, it's everything to do with, the, you know, to, to do with what's going on. But if you don't do that, then what you write is sappy. But if you just write from this, sour perspective or this dutiful perspective or this kind of 
showing off perspective, what's the point? So yeah, passion's everything. Well, and, and related to that, it's interesting your point about sappiness and also sourness. One of the things that in addition to passion that I think characterizes all of your writing is it's, it's deeply humane. And part of the reason I think the, the, the books register, whether they be of the shorter pieces or the, the big three, let's call them, biographies. No, they, no, we've, we've, we've discarded that, that uh, no, no, no we'll, yet, that it Okay, be. all right. <laughs> um, you just have such a, a sense of, without, a, again, abandoning uh, a sense of, 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 of standards, artistic standards, you have such a sense of humanity towards your subjects. Is that something that just you're conscious of or just naturally comes out as you write? I think it was something, and it actually in this book, and look, looking to get lost, I try to address that to some extent because I point to, uh, you know, to the, the way, the examples that I had in my father and my two grandfathers right. in particular. I mean, the whole family, but say those, all of whom I write about in, in the book. And with my father and his father, it was the practice of medicine, what they brought to it, the humanity that they brought to it, the respect that they gave to their patients, the way in which uh, my father to the end of his life, which was, he was almost 101 and still working, but he taught the lesson that it's the patient who is the center of things as well as the social fabric. And um, so I think that, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm not trying to hold up anybody is the perfect example. I mean, but, uh, and my, my other grandfather, my mother's father um, was a teacher. He taught at Boston Latin School for about 30 years. And, uh, you know, it was a big uh, hoo-ha when he retired and, and he wrote a book about education. But to me, it was, it was his humanity and it was his enthusiasm. And he would just, you know, he brought so much enthusiasm to everything he did up until the day he died. And I can just remember as a little kid, I'd be with him and he'd say, hey, Pete, you know, and he'd point out over <laughs> something and I, and I would be so embarrassed, but, but it was that enthusiasm which meant so much to me. So I think to some extent it's that, but I, I also, I, I've been reading, and I, I don't mean to int introduce this as a subject of conversation, but I've been reading all the reviews and the conversation about the Philip Roth biography. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that struck me, and I didn't, haven't read the biography and I'm not talking about that at all, but, with Elvis, with Sam Cooke, uh, with Sam Phillips, I fully recognize that they, like me, like you, like all of us, is an imperfect human being. And you'll find uh, in each of the biographies, things that they've done, which are, let's say, inexcusable, if, if to the extent that we need to excuse or not excuse. Right. And they're not left out, but no. they're, they're, they're included, they're contextual, they're included within a context of things. They're not, they look at, aha, look, look, look at this, look at this. And what's interesting about it is in almost no cases have reviewers or readers focused on these, these stories. I'm not gonna bring up what they are because that would cause inordinate attention to them. But the point is they're there and they are sometimes things which I'm so disappointed that the person I'm writing about whom I care about very much I'm so disappointed that they did, but they did them and that and they're and they're human. I mean, it's my yeah. friend Bonnie Fritz, the songwriter. I mean, one time I was with him in Nashville and he said, that's disgusting. And then he paused and he said, that's human. Yeah. <laughs> and it's it's true that all disgusting things, well, even though they may all be human, may not be excusable. But but that's what I'm trying to do with with I'm trying to be honest. I feel when I first met Charlie Rich um, in 1970, and he was a he was a profile and both feel like going home in Lost Highway. And I've never liked anybody more on first uh, meeting than him and his wife, Margaret Ann, who was a songwriter. And the story he told was such a sad story, a melancholy story about his agoraphobia, about his fear of, you know, uh, performing or his, his dislike of performing, about his misgivings, about his guilt, about his alcoholism, about all these things. And when I wrote the chapter, and if you read it today, if you read the chapter and feel like on home, it's the mildest kind of chapter in the world. But I was just so depressed because I felt like I had to put these things down. I put them within the framework of somebody that I admired and that I liked so much, but I couldn't leave them out and be true to him or be true to me or be true to the reader. And I thought, well, this is terrible. I'll never see Charlie or Margaret Ann again. 
And in fact, when the book came out, I mean, this, this, there isn't a happy ending for everything, but in this case, when the book came out, Charlie ordered 30 copies to give to his family. He said, you know, man, it, it's, it was hard sometimes, but, the, but it's the truth and that's what you have to serve. And I, I, that's, you know, I just feel like there's, there's no alternative in these things. That's what you have to do. You mentioned earlier how you'd been working on a novel when you started work on the Elvis book. Uh, published fiction, you, um, I mean, your initial uh, ambition as a writer was to be a fiction writer. Mm -hmm. uh, writing fiction involves using, in some cases, different muscles from writing biography, nonfiction. To what extent does, do you think, using, having those extra muscles to use has informed and enriched your, uh, you're writing nonfiction. I'll tell you a funny story, which you probably don't have time for, but I'll, I'll tell you. Yep. Uh, when I was a kid in the ninth grade uh, at the school I went to at Roxbury Latin, you had to write a, a, a history prize essay with, with you know, real research and it was long. And, and I wrote about the Scopes trial and William Jennings Bryan and um, Clarence Darrow. And, uh, I looked at the, anyway, my aim in that was to tell, was to bring the story so vivid, as vividly alive as if it were fiction. And I looked at it the other day and I'm not sure I succeeded. <laughs> and I was like, but, but that was, and, but the first time, and in all the time that I was writing nonfiction, I always saw it as kind of a detour from what I really intended to do, which was to write novels. I've written 10 novels, published one part of another, had another one accepted, everybody got fired who, you know, <laughs> the publisher folded, the editor got fired. Um, but uh, with the, with the uh, Elvis, I suddenly realized that in effect, I was writing a novel with it, that it had mm -hmm. this vast landscape, these great characters, these characters who in a sense enabled me to go far beyond what I'd ever felt conf confident or competent to do in, in the novels. I mean, I could, take what, what I learned, what, what people, what they told me, the pictures that people, people painted and paint this, this landscape and, and paint these characters who were as great as any characters I've ever read about. I mean, they may not have been as educated, um, but they were as ambitious, they were uh, as full of hope and dreams uh, and they were as, as um, fallible. So that's really, and so, Really, from that point on, from the time I started writing what became Last Train to Memphis, it was supposed to be one volume and it split into two as I was writing. Uh, and then with the Sam Cooke and the Sam Phillips, to me, that was like writing a novel. It was like writing novels. And I, I, you know, you don't have the leeway. You can't either make anything up or you can't, I mean, you're trying to, everything is interpretive. So if you wrote an Elvis book with exactly the same you know, material that I had in the same interviews, you'd write a very different book because it comes from whatever point of view you're writing and, and, uh, and it, would, it would be just as good, it would just be different. But, uh, but in any case, so, so I, I suppose that that did feed it. Now lately, the stories, the short stories I've been writing, one of the things I was proudest of, by the way, was with my first collection of short stories, or my second with Almost Grown or Mr. Downshell, which I published when I was 20 and 22. Uh, Tilly Olson wrote me a note. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, saying the author of Tell Me a Riddle. Yes, Tell Me a Riddle, exactly. And she, uh, so she, uh, and there was an essay about her recently, an appreciative essay, I think, in the Times book review. Yes. But uh, she wrote a note applauding, you know, my work, and that was pretty thrilling. But the stories that I've written recently are sort of a weird departure, almost going in the opposite direction from what the nonfiction is, in the sense that. I read uh, Don Powell's My Home is Far Away, which is a sort of very uh, experience-based novel about her growing up in Ohio. It's like Fanny and Alexandra go to Ohio, the Bergman film, they go to Ohio. But it, that freed me up to write about real events in my life, but not be confined to writing about what actually happened. I mean, to just take off and, and make both the experiences and the people that I had and the people that I knew and put them in an, in, in an entirely different light. So that even though there may be something that somebody say, oh, that's what, that came from this, it may have come from this, but 
you know, 90% of it is, or I don't know what percent, but a lot of it isn't. So that's been really fun to do. And maybe I got that from the nonfiction. I don't know. Yeah. Do you have a standard writing procedure? I mean, are you one of these writers who writes every day or mm -hmm. how do you do it? I, I'll tell you, I, I think I've told you this before, but we'll share it with an audience. Um, <laughs> when I was 15, I read uh, the Hemingway interview in the Paris Review, um, which is a terrific interview and it's a written interview. And I, um, I don't think it was brought up in the, uh, um, you know, recent documentary. The Ken, the Ken Burns, no. Yeah, um, but it was done with uh, Terry, what was it done? No, I forget who it was done. I think it was done with George Plumpton. Right. So it's quite constructive, but anyway, and it's all about, <laughs> Technique and application, I guess, is, is what I would say. But in the course of that interview, he talks about how he writes every day in the morning. You know, that leaves him free to do whatever he wants in the afternoon. He can, you know, um, he can do whatever he wants at night. He may be wrecked at night, but he's going to get up in the morning and, and write. And he's aiming to write as many true words as he can. And I, I translated that into 500 or 600. I don't, I don't think it says that. Mm -hmm. And so I decided when I was 15, I said, you know, Hemingway can, if, if Hemingway does this, I may not be able to write as well as Hemingway, but I can write, I bet I could write 750 words a day. <laughs> so I started when I was 15 and I really have done that ever since. I, now my life has become more complicated. Once I started on the Elvis, the, a lot of other things in, in, uh, introduced themselves and I was traveling so much, I'd go out for three weeks, I'd come home for two weeks. So obviously it wasn't quite the same, but when I'm writing, I just, you know, I will write every morning. I'll write as much as I can. Um, I'm aiming for more than 500 words. I, I feel like I will never get to the end and I may not live long enough to finish if I wrote only 500 words, but that's what I, that's what I do. And uh, when I was uh, before the Elvis, I think I kept sacred the idea that you write in longhand in pencil uh -huh. in the book. Uh, for the first draft, then the second yeah. draft you, uh, but now I just write everything with the computer and I find it uh, you're perfectly compatible. Okay, so n you don't feel any any guilt over over giving into technology? Zero. Okay. <laughs> I believe the novelist Don DeLillo still writes on a manual typewriter and he has spoken of, he needs that sense of almost physical opposition, you know, the, the pressure of the finger on the key and feeling the smash of the, the key against the paper. Uh, but if, longhand, you were, that, if you were in the next room, you would hear the smash <laughs> of the keyboard of the computer. You know, I'm amazed I haven't gone through a lot of keyboard. Things. But uh, uh, no, I, I have my uh, typewriter in the attic. It's yeah. an Olympia portable. Uh, and, uh, but no, I, I, you know, people talk, I, I have a friend, uh, who just says, oh, your, your writing style changes completely when you're doing it this way, that way, or, you know, I, I don't find that at all. I mean, one, the one only thing about writing on a computer on a word, word processor is simply that the idea of drafts has become an entirely different thing. Yes. Yeah. Because what, what it is, let's say if I'm writing a biography or if I'm working on the Dick Curlis, it, it, and, you know, this is a long process. It's a long commitment. And so I'll write to a certain point and I don't go back and reread the next day, but I'll pick up where I, where I did. But as I pick up, I'll, I may go back and say, oh, this has to change or that has to change. So every day, I just number every day, you know, this is draft one, mm -hmm. one, two, three, up to the point, you know, 30 or 35, and then I can go on to draft two. And they're all slightly different, but you're always changing. And you're able to do that in a way you couldn't before. Yeah. This, this friend of mine says, oh, that's terrible. It opens up too many possibilities, it's like multi-track recording. But again, I, I don't agree at all. I think it just opens up opportunities. And if you got frozen by it, then you shouldn't do it. But, but I never found that. Well, that's an interesting point that your, your friend makes. I mean, I would come down obviously on your side. It, it, it's more liberating. But the book, not to give it, not to need plugging with our astute <laughs> audience, but it covers such a, such great, a wide such a great range. Picture on the cover. It, it's a great and, and <laughs> everything about it. The, the 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 font, the way the relationship of type to 
to the great picture. It's 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 really well done. Wait, a minute. we just have to break for one second. Yes. Susan Myers has designed all my books since 1979, since the last Highway Highway. I met her at a Waylon Jennings concert. I was introduced by Derek Gessner, who put on a concert, and she's designed all the books. And I always tell her that when I go out on these book tours, virtual or otherwise, the only thing people want to talk about, the only people want to know, the only thing people want to know about is the design. Yeah. And she doesn't believe me, but now you've borne me out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, really good. And in fact, before you interrupted me, I was going to say how consistently good the, the designs have been. But anyway, I mean, the Sam Phillips, I think, is in a class of its own. I could reach up and get it, but we have a limited time. Um, but to return to my question, uh, your friend's point can be put to the test here because there are pieces that date back at least mm -hmm. to the to the uh, 80s. Yeah. At, thinking about it. Is there any shift in style? I mean, obviously, some of it's inevitable with age and experience. But do you think when you did give in to the computer, that changed at all in how you write? Not obviously it changed how, but in what you write? No, I, I don't think at all. I mean, it's like the Doc Palmas in some ways. The great from, songwriter. Yes, the great songwriter who wrote Save the Last yeah. Dance for Me and Little Sister. Lonely, and, uh, Lonely uh, Avenue. And, and uh, a wonderful person. Yeah. And in a way, I think uh, that may have found, at least from my point of view, it found its, it found its most perfect form. I mean, the, the profile, I mean, I don't know why that is. It has nothing to do with the way yeah. it was written. But all of them, I think, are just uh, drawn, born along by the same impulse, by the same impetus. I mean, I can remember writing the Johnny Shines chapter and feel like going home. And I was up at camp, which my grandfather was running in the summer of 70, and then I ran from then on, the summer camp for boys. And um, it, uh, a, and I was so stuck because I was so full of love and enthusiasm and whatever knowledge there was at that time, not as much as there is now. And I wanted to convey all of this and I just could not go on. It had nothing to do with typewriter, pencil, computer. And I think that's the thing I've always struggled to overcome. It's just finding, finding a, uh, I mean, I think every writer must, but it's try, trying to find a form because you have, in a sense, you have so many things to say. Now people talk about writer's block. I would imagine that that's what it comes from as much as anything. It's just the idea of admiring the perfect, the perfect, yeah, the perfect imagine, imagine thing for something imperfectly realized. But um, yeah, anyway, I was stuck, I, I don't know, for a week or two, you know, and, and my wife, Alexander said, for God's sake, you just write it, write the damn thing. <laughs> Except maybe a little more emphatically. But Johnny Shines brings up, it comes back to an earlier point about enthusiasm. I don't know that non-writers appreciate how much easier it is to write negatively than it is to write positively. Mm -hmm. um, because, if you're being negative, it's just, it's just so much simpler and easier. It's also, it's easier because it, it simplifies. You don't have to weigh different values and aspects as you do when you write positively. And that makes, I think, your achievement all the more impressive because almost everything you write is written out of enthusiasm and as you say, out of love. And that's a lot harder. Well, you know, I think that it's um, one of the things about it is that it's easy to call attention to yourself. Every yes. person you're writing about, every interview you do offers you the opportunity, in a sense, to mock that person, to show them up. Yes. And showing off at the expense of the subject or the person you're writing about is the easiest thing. Showing off your own cleverness is the easiest right. thing. And so much writing, uh, I think, is done in that spirit with the idea of, you know, shine the light on me. And, um, uh, but I don't know. I mean, it, it to me that that never offered. It never seemed to me a, a, an alternative. I mean, it never seemed to me anything that I would consider doing, and and I just wouldn't. So it. it uh, but it's one of the things that I would say puts me off the most about things that I'm not draw, drawn to. About writing that I'm not drawn to. I, I don't care about. I mean, I'm not interested in making a judgment. I don't care one way or another. But it's just I'm not going to read that. It just doesn't interest me. Um, 
I'm going to just turn on a light here because okay. I feel like I'm fading into darkness. Well, it's it's appropriate that you do that because for all these years you've been turning various lights <laughs> onto American culture, odd corners and interesting characters. Um, I was struck by saying about how easy it is for a writer to call attention to himself. And I use the male um, pronoun because it's much more common for himself and herself doing it. Um, and all of your writing, I think, your all your nonfiction writing is a kind of conversation, except the, 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 the real trick of it is that it's ultimately a conversation between the subject and the reader, and you find a way, having initiated it, to sort of keep yourself out of it. I mean, you're there, but you're not this overt presence. Even when you know you're the one asking the question of um, Doc Palmas, it's still more the reader who's there rather than you are, because you're not inserting yourself beyond the necessary placement you need to have. Well, I think occasionally, sense? occasionally I'll use a persona. Yeah. I mean, you can see, for instance, in the Howlin' Wolf chapter in, in Looking to Get Lost, how it's a true story. Uh, I write a story, Wolf says, read it to me. Uh, I, I just can't read it to him. I want to sink through the floor in embarrassment. Another kid yeah. reads it. I want to sink even deep further through the floor. Now, that is true to life. That's true. But I'm also considering that I'm writing, I'm, I'm creating a persona to show Wolf off better. But each of the, the biographies has been entirely different in a certain sense with respect to what you're asking me. I mean, the Elvis, for example, I attempted to exert the most rigorous self-control or discipline to keep myself entirely out of it. And somebody I've known for a long time, um, a critic, I should say, uh, I mean, not of me, just a critic in general, and was deeply distressed that I hadn't brought up but what about that great review you wrote of Elvis's from Elvis in Memphis and Rolling Stone? That was so, yeah. you know, Mark said, and who cares? You know, that has nothing to do with what I'm writing about. With the Sam Phillips almost counter to that, uh, I, in order to write interestingly about the, the latter, later part of his life, after he left the music business, which was the vast majority of his life, he pretty much had a decade where he created, you know, what Jerry Wexler said was, was a, a lifetime's worth of, of work. But um, to make the latter part of his life interesting, I mean, I was witness to a lot of it. I was present for a lot of it. And so I turned it almost into a picaresque adventure, which was in, in which I had a first person role, but not a characterological role, the biggest character aspect. And again, I talk about persona. It, it was like, um, Sam, I mean, there's a bunch of times when Sam is talking to me and it's at one point, he, uh, well, there are two things. I mean, one thing he's saying, you know, you look at me and you think I'm a kindly, you know, uh, just uh, gracious or no, that wasn't the word, but you know, I'm a kindly old man. Well, let me tell you something. I was a mean motherfucker, and, you know, but there's another, there's another part where uh, he, um, he says to me, and this is true, I mean, but I didn't have to put it in the book or I could have put it in, not in, but he says to me, he says, you know, my son Knox, my son Knox, I, I have to repeat to be like Sam, but I say, my, my son Knox, he fell in love with you the minute he met you, but I didn't. <laughs> and, and, uh, and it took about 20 years before Sam accepted me. And that's part of the story. It doesn't matter about me. It's just, that's who Sam was. Right. He was not going to make quick judgments. Now the Sam Cook, on the other hand, I felt like what I was trying to do I was inspired by the uh, recent husband and wife translation, not that recent anymore, the translation of Anna Karenina. There was a tone there that I just, it, it, to me, it suited or it fit what I was trying to do with Sam Cooke. But for example, with Sam Cooke's wife, Barbara, um, who I may be the only person in the book that liked Barbara. I mean, <laughs> and I mean, she's a bright woman. She's a uh, an independent woman. She. Uh, um, but she was not popular either among Sam's friends or, you know, among the people I was interviewing. But I, um, but I wanted to represent her truly. She's a difficult woman. She's not, I mean, she's, she, I think she herself would concede she's, she's not an easy person to get along with. But the trouble was that in the, in, when I, I interviewed her for three or four days running and the quotes she gave or the, the insights that she had were great, but her syntax was so 
it was of such a sort, or syntax, syntax was such a sort, that if I had presented it like that, I felt like the reader would get a, an opposite impression to the one mm -hmm. that I was trying to convey. So I actually paraphrased, I used indirect discourse to try to bring her to life in a way that did, you know, a justice to her intelligence, her ferocity, <laughs> and, you know, her difficulty too. So, I mean, you sort of approach things in a, a slightly different way, but, um, but anyway, that, that, that's, that's a roundabout answer to your very direct question. Uh, well, but it was a good one. It was a good, one. <laughs> it was a good uh, question. So what have you been reading lately? You mentioned you've been following the, the, the reviews of the Roth biography. What books have you been reading? You know, the book that I, yeah, I mean, I, I'm so bad at, you know, I, I'd have to have a list in front of me, The Cold Millions by Jess Walter. That to me is just a masterpiece, like mm -hmm. all of his books. I mean, like all of his books, it's entirely different from any of the others. And it's just a wonderful book. And it, it has such a clarity and a translucence and, uh, and, and a, you know, a, I, I think a political relevance to our time, but it's also an historical uh, in a novel about the labor movement, about the Wobblies. It, it's just absolutely brilliant. So, I mean, that's what I would, uh, uh, you know, pick out as, as something that has really jumped jumped out at me. Um, I was brought brought to mind, uh, or I was br uh, brought to remember by the Ken Burns documentary on Hemingway, how much I loved Hemingway's boat, uh, and uh, which to me is the best of all the things ever written about Hemingway. It's that, just, that Paul Hendrickson? Paul Hendrickson, yeah, yep. wonderful writer, just a great writer. And a writer who takes a completely idiosyncratic approach to every subject. Maybe sort of like Jess Walter in that every one of his books is quite different, but the Hemingway's boat, to, to, to draw a portrait of Hemingway through the, the Pilar or the Pilar um, and its construction, and uh, it, it just, it's absolutely wonderful and absolutely brilliant. I want to read this new book about Faulkner too, though, and I, I, uh, uh, I don't read much nonfiction, but Alexandra read the, uh, um, you know, Faulkner and, and the roots of this, his, his writing having its roots in the Civil War. Have you read that? I have not, no. Well, I, I, I got a sample, you know, on my yeah. on the e-book sample, and it's just, it's really great. It's very fresh, and uh, so, I, and maybe then I'll read Absalom, Absalom again, but that, that, that's hard work for me. Yes, uh, Faulkner is hard work, I think, for everybody, and he preferred it that way. Uh, one of our, we don't have much time left, one of the, uh, our participants would, uh, is talking about how uh, imposing, awesome, and prodigious was, was well, uh, let me read, them. how awesome, imposing, prodigious was Wolf the first time you met him. What was the first impression like? We're of course referring to Howlin' Wolf, the, the magnificent, uh, barely describable blues singer. For those of you who've never heard, and if you haven't, when this is over, Google, listen, Howlin' Wolf. But anyway, the yeah, first, your first impression of the wolf. Watch Howlin' Wolf on Shindig uh, with the Rolling Stones presenting him in 1965. Just, I, I had it as number one, two, and three as the greatest television events in all. <laughs> um, no, I think awesome, prodigious, and uh, indecipherable would be about the best. <laughs> you know, yeah. he, he was just, uh, I mean, Sam Phillips described meeting him and saying, you know, as much as I was observing the wolf, he was observing me even better. And, but he didn't say a lot. And I was with Johnny Shines, whom we were talking about a few minutes ago, the great uh, blues singer who was sort of a disciple of Robert Johnson. And Wolf was his first idol when he started out singing in the 30s. He was called, Johnny Shines was called Little Wolf. And we were up in Vermont and we approached Wolf, whom Johnny hadn't seen in years and he was so excited. And Johnny had no more idea what, I don't mean what Wolf was talking about. I don't mean it was nonsense. It was just Wolf was in his own world. Yeah. And, uh, but he was so overwhelming as a performer and as a person, he just had such depths, I thought. And mm -hmm. as Sam Phillips said, uh, this is where the soul of man never dies. And that's pretty much my first, last, and always impression. A question from an anonymous attendee who writes, I have heard that you're working on a book of letters by Colonel Parker. Colonel Parker, of course, being Elvis's famous, some would say notorious manager. Can you comment on this and say when it will be published? Oh, you can never say when something's gonna be published. <laughs> <laughs> but I can say, I, I said in, in uh, Looking to Get Lost, I, I spoke of how, I mean, there's a chapter on 
the colonel and called me and the colonel, which is really about my relationship with him, which to me was infinitely enjoyable, educational, amusing, and ultimately futile if I was looking for results, if I were looking for results, but, but just ultimately rewarding beyond futile. But I mentioned in, in looking to get lost that I was hoping I'd been for about 20 years, I'd been or 15 years at that point, I had been trying to, uh, to do a book which would focus on his letters, which are absolutely brilliant, they're funny, they're strategic, they're just, uh, they show a si sides of him that nobody would ever imagine. And, and I'm sure after seeing the, um, uh, oh, what's his name, uh, Moulin Rouge, um, uh, Baz Luhrmann, seeing the Baz Luhrmann. coming Baz Luhrmann film on Elvis, it, it, people will be even, find it even harder to believe because I think that this will be very anti-Colonel, but he was- And isn't Tom, isn't Tom Hanks supposed to play the Colonel? He is playing the Colonel, and, and I would imagine that his portrayal will lend warmth to a very chilly script. But, uh, but the thing is that, it, so for me, this is, I, I, I am doing that now, I'm working on it now. Um, who knows how long, but, but it's absolutely, uh, it's totally exciting and it's fascinating. I'm going through thousands of letters. He, he was such a good writer for somebody who uh, ended his education in the fourth grade in the Netherlands and came to this country, you know, as, um, as a stowaway or at least as an illegal alien in 1920. Well, he came a couple of times, but say roughly around 28 um, with, uh, with very little English. And um, he's just a brilliant guy and absolutely fat and a revolutionary guy in his own way. Yeah. And, and so it's, uh, and what I want to do in addition to uh, presenting the letters and uh, you know selecting them and um, and and actually providing what I realize now I want to do is to provide a running narrative, not not the usual thing where you footnote everything, but just to set the letters up so it tells yeah. the story from beginning to end in an ongoing way. But at the front, I want to write a portrait of Colonel Parker or Andreas von Kirk. Um, uh, which may be of about the length of the Dick Curl is 25, 30,000 words that I wanted to be, I wanted to be fun and amusing because he was just a fascinating and very mm -hmm. funny guy and very, but, uh, but I hope it'll provide a much deeper uh, picture of a much more complex person than, than the world has tended to uh, see. We're Almost at 4.30, so one last participant question. What was the most difficult profile to write in the book? I don't know that that's, I think all of them were exciting to write in one way or another. I mean, in this book, it's like in the, uh, in Looking to Get Lost, it's like the Merle Haggard chapter describes some of the difficulties of pursuing Merle Haggard and of, it's, it's like I describe, I don't think I describe in the chapter, but I have described uh, you know, what happened with it, in one of the interviews I did with him. I, I say, you're such a great songwriter. I know you must have had a lot of influences that, that helped you get to the point you were. Can you talk about, you know, can you cite any or na name any of the inf great, inf great country music songwriters that, you know, that influenced you? And there was a pause of, you know, one like this, boom, 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 boom. Finally, he says, Nope. <laughs> so, but writing about Solomon Burke, whom I dearly loved, who was just one of the great um, figures, or, you know, just one of the great the people I have most enjoyed in life. But writing about him, not just in an adulatory way, but in an adulatory way, but in some ways revealing something about the painfulness of some parts of our, some moments in our relationship. That was kind of hard to do. I mean, yeah. uh, but but I, no, I, I don't I don't think that you know I don't think difficulty. Sometimes it's like with the Johnny Shines. It may be difficult to write, but that doesn't really have to do with the challenge of the particular subject. Yeah. Leslie, I'm assuming you want to take over now since it's four thirty. And there she is. Here I am. Thank you all. Thank you both. That was such an interesting conversation. I loved hearing about all of your uh, 
anecdotes and I have a lot of things to look up on Google when we're done. <laughs> um, not all of them, many I know, but not all. Um, and I didn't know about that Colonel, uh, um, what's, no, Colonel Parker book. Colonel Parker. Yeah, so I mean the movie that Boz Lerman is doing, so I'll look forward to that. Um, and participate. No, no, thank don't, you. Don't, look for, don't look forward to that. Look forward to the book, which is coming out. Right. The, the letters yes, book. <laughs> I will. I love, in the movie. Now read the book. Right. I love all books of letters, so I will also look forward to that. And th so thank you both for being here, and thank you all you participants for being here. We have a couple more events this afternoon, including the Melopia, which is going to be beautiful and starts at seven o'clock, and a whole day of events tomorrow. So we we'll hope we hope that you'll join us. And again, thank you so much. And I hope you both have a great day. You too, everybody out there too. And it's, it's great to be back, uh, you know, 14 years later with Myron. Right, well, hopefully we'll be in real life next year and maybe the, maybe your next book will be out by then. We'll do it for the Colonel book. Yeah, absolutely, <laughs> that'll be great. All right, thanks again and take care everyone. Okay, bye-bye. Okay.